Today we talk about Christian behaviour. How should I relate to people in my daily life? But before we can begin to answer that, there is a far more important question. How should I relate to God? Get that right and all the rest will follow. I want to begin by reading a passage from the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, where we're told how Moses meets the unknown God, who when asked his name will only say that he is, I am who I am. Exodus 3 verse 14. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and lo, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. Then he said, Do not come near. Put off your shoes from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. It's the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. What does Moses feel himself called to do when he meets this unknown God? He hears an immediate demand to clean himself up. No dirty boots. Like a Muslim entering a mosque, like a Hindu coming into another person's home, he must put off his shoes. Shoes that are soiled with the dust and mud and excrement and refuse of where he's been up until now. The place on which you are standing is holy ground. An encounter with the living God seems immediately to create a demand for holiness and in limited fallen human beings a sense of being unclean, not right, of needing and wanting to do something about it. We feel a gap, a distance between ourselves and what we have encountered, a gap that hurts, one that we want to bridge. This is true even of experiences where the person may not consciously understand that they are in the presence of God. Confronted by the beauty and amazing variety of nature, the environmentalist feels outraged that we wantonly destroy that beauty and variety. The quality of what is there, which Christians would say is an expression of God in his creation, seems to demand something from us. Similarly, the animal lover, responding to the otherness, the strangeness, the mystery and beauty of the other living creatures, is appalled that we should exploit them and even exterminate them for our own selfish ends. On the more positive side, the birth of a child, the miracle of a new creation, seems to stir extraordinary joy and delight, even in people who feel they have little or no experience of God. Children, as the saying goes, bring their own love with them. They create in us a wish to care, nurture, protect and cherish them. My point is that this reaction is natural to us. We have in us a God-implanted, God-triggered impulse to holiness. The Orthodox Church insists that man was created good. And even though, to quote the liturgy of St John Chrysostom, we have fallen away from what we were meant to be, we have not entirely forgotten. Nudges from outside keep calling to us to be better than we are. The great religions of the world have almost all developed rules, codes of behaviour to meet this need. There's a wealth of guidance as to what you should do, and even more as to what you should not do. I want now to show you what I will call a counter-icon. This is not a Christian image conveying a truth about God. Rather, it is an image of a terrible and false alternative, which can nevertheless show us something that we can learn from. This is an image by the English poet and artist William Blake of the God whom he thought was worshipped by Jews in their synagogues and by Christians in their churches. Blake called this figure Nobodaddy because he was nobody's daddy, not in any way a loving father. Instead, he is a terrible old man, blind and vengeful, 
hurling down lightning and thunderbolts of wrath on human beings who have offended him. He is the cruel tormentor whom Blake thinks has cursed man with an enormous book of rules which we are bullied into keeping and punished if we break. At the bottom of the picture is the crushed human race, and to the right the artist has put a representative human being bowed down under the divine anger, the knife still in his hand with which he has killed his fellow man. For Blake, this tyrant god is the enemy of love, frustrating our desires, denying us freedom, spontaneity, pleasure and joy. The church and the state are his twin instruments of terror and repression. Try to keep the rules of this god and he will design you a hundred more rules to keep you crushed, humbled and guilty. He is the blight of the minds that know him. Give him his chance and he will turn you into a vengeful, moralising, censorious and destructive monster like himself. If this is your picture of God, and most of us have a corner for it in our minds, take it out and burn it. Beg God's forgiveness for slandering him so. Throw it away, for it is a dangerous and destructive lie, an offence against the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know? Because we have heard and seen what Jesus Christ was and is, and we have heard his own saying, He who has seen me has seen the Father. John 14 verse 9. If the Old Testament on its own sometimes gives the impression that Blake may have more than a grain of truth in what he says, remember that the Orthodox Church teaches that everything in the Old Testament must be understood in the light of the revelation of God that is Jesus Christ. Nothing has done the Christian Church more harm than this false picture of God. It reflects badly on his followers. In Australia, we accuse Christians of being wowsers. Wowsers are killjoys, people unable to have fun themselves, determined to prevent others having a good time. Christians are thought of as people who are against booze, drugs and sex in particular. They are frightened to let themselves go and keen to stop anyone else doing so. They are choked with moral inhibitions like an egg-bound chicken. If that is how I, as a Christian, look to you like an egg-bound chicken, then something is wrong. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10. And that doesn't just mean life in some future state. The kingdom of heaven is in the midst of you or within you. Luke chapter 17 verse 21. Heavenly life starts now. The Roman Catholic Church, before it recognises a saint, asks if that person had hilaritas, joyfulness. If Christians don't look joyful to you, full of life, it may be that you're not looking hard enough but it is more likely that we still have a lot to learn or even that we are not yet fully disciples of Jesus. But you may say, surely Christians are against booze, drugs, sex and such. The answer is that God created all things good. It is only their misuse that Christians oppose, or to be more truthful, only their misuse that Christians ought to oppose. Drugs can be medicinal, or like caffeine, a generally harmless pick-me-up. Sexual love was made to be delightful. Wine, as the psalmist says, is to gladden the heart of man. Psalm 104 verse 15. My second daughter thanks God that we have a religion that puts wine at the centre of its ritual. As for human behaviour, Christians would say, that we have in the Bible a manual that describes how human beings function best by seeking to know God and his will for us, by working together and not apart from one another, by caring for each other rather than following self-interest. As with the manual for a motor car, there is a list of do's and don'ts. Love drives the engine, hate clogs it up. 
You can't prove that selfishness wrecks the machine or damages other traffic on the road just by reading that in the manual. But by putting hatred in your tank as the driving force, you'll grind to a halt soon enough. The social Darwinism that is so fashionable at present, which argues that we're driven by selfish genes, that we are by nature ruthlessly and selfishly competitive, which also implies that this is inevitable and productive, that is a creed that is a recipe for disaster. Try living like that and you and your community will break down sick and self-disgusted. We were made to live in a community of love, and only Christ can lead you back to where you long to be. If many faiths respond to a human need for holiness, there is one major difference between Christianity and all the other religions I can think of. Stay for a moment with my image of the motor car manual. A number of creeds can offer instructions for how we human beings work best, and most of them can offer human teachers, gurus, who will give us their idea of what their particular manual is saying. We Christians do not ignore the manual given to the Jews in the Old Testament, the Jewish law. But we have something radically different. Instead of just a book of instructions, we belong in a workshop where we have a living instructor, who not only invented us body and soul, but who built the repair section himself. He works along with us, showing us by what he says and does how the human machine works, how to put it right when it's gone wrong, and how to keep it in good order. Why is the old way of governing our behaviour, the Book of Rules, inadequate to our need? Since even the best Christians among us sometimes feel tempted to go back to the Book of Rules and try by human effort to live by them, to do what St Paul calls going again under the law, see Galatians chapter 4 verse 21, we need to know why that doesn't work. First, it directs the attention of us God-deprived human beings to ourselves and to our own behaviour. I'm going to say something rather shocking, especially to people like me who were sent to church by unbelieving parents to learn the difference between right and wrong. Christianity is not primarily about being good. Its main purpose is to know and love God and our fellow human beings as ourselves. Good and evil in Christian terms are harmony with God or departure from God's way. God's way or not God's way. Being good, being holy, means being aligned with God, and that follows naturally from knowing and loving him, not from moral efforts to be good. A second problem with the Book of Rules, the old law, is that it can't tell us which of the moral demands we should put first at any given time. There are only 24 hours in a day, that is, presuming you need no sleep. Tomorrow is a new day. Should you occupy it by honouring your father and mother, Exodus 20, verse 12, and pay mum that long-promised visit? Or should you rather render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, Matthew 22, verse 21, repeated in the Gospel of Mark and in Luke, and spend the time doing your tax return? Or maybe you should heed Christ's warning as to the judgment that awaits those who neglect the sick, Matthew 25, verses 36 to 46, and go and see that friend who has just gone into hospital. Any reasonably conscientious person will end their day feeling exhausted and guilty at having done only a fraction of what the Book of Rules says they ought to have done. The third problem is that the old law, the Book of Rules, is inflexible. It can't be applied in all the variety of human situations without leading us to do something dreadful. Take the general condemnation of lying, deceit. Most of us would go along with that. Pope John Paul II is on record as saying that a lie is always evil, always a sin. 
Well, I might go along with the idea that a lie is always evil, since any deceit between human beings is a breach of the loving trust that should exist between us. But as for a lie being always a sin, consider for a moment a favourite problem posed by moralists. Imagine, they say, that you are in Germany under Hitler and you have hidden some Jewish friends in your attic. The SS comes to your door and asks, are there Jews in your house? Do you answer yes or no? If you hesitate or refuse to answer, that will be taken as a yes. What does the moral law which condemns lying require of you here? And what is the love of Christ asking you to do? Let's pray you never have to face such a test. But there is a more ordinary problem. Say you have a friend who has an absolutely hideous, disfiguring birthmark all down one side of her face. In consequence, she feels awful about herself, sometimes suicidal. One day she puts you on the spot. David, I want you to be absolutely straight with me. Do I look ugly? What is the love of Christ calling you to say? Is it, well, yes, darling, you do look ghastly, but we love you anyway. Would a fib there have been a sin? The last problem is the greatest of all. As a way to holiness, to goodness, the old law, the book of rules, doesn't work. As most of us know to our cost, we keep the rules for a while, then come crashing down, feel wretched, and then start all over again and crash once more. Perhaps it is as well that this happens, for the occasional person who thinks they have succeeded turns into a monster of self-righteousness, tut-tutting about the wrongdoing of others, thanking God that he or she is not like other men. A quote from Jesus' parable of the Pharisee, Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. All of us enjoy a bit of picking holes in other people, and the law gives us sinners wonderful opportunities to do so. We need to remember that when Jesus Christ in his earthly life was harsh on anyone, it was on those people who thought themselves better than others. You may think it odd that St Paul, who is so convinced that we need to be rescued from law, still thinks of the law as good. Romans chapter 7 verse 13 and again 1 Timothy verse chapter 1 verse 8. In general terms, law shows us what God requires, marking out what is good and what is evil. And it reminds us constantly of how far we fall short. Paul again in Romans chapter 7 verse 7. So we can put some real oomph into those responses throughout the liturgy, Lord have mercy. But when we feel how much we need God to be easy on us, the problem is that the law provides no way out. The Old Testament sacrifices of bulls and goats to make amends are no longer practiced, even among the Jews. However, St Paul says that the law leads us to Christ in Romans chapter 5 verses 20 to 21 and it does that because it brings us eventually to despair of ourselves and of our human efforts. When we have tried and failed so many times desperation brings us to the point where we're prepared to say to God I give up. I can't do anything about myself. Unless you do something nothing can be done. Please take me over. That point of self-surrender, of what the scriptures call dying to self, living to Christ, is bitterly hard, and most of us have to do it again and again. The initial turning to Christ was done for most of us at our baptism when we were tiny, but the whole of our lives will be activating that commitment, repeating the handover time after time. St. Seraphim of Saroff was fond of saying that the whole purpose of life was to acquire the Holy Spirit. That is why the Orthodox Church does not produce great tomes of moral theology or 600-page catechisms that try to tell you in every situation what would be right or what would be wrong, what is venial sin, not too serious, or mortal, soul-killing sin. 
The Orthodox Church doesn't go about holiness by watching points. We try to call the heart, mind and spirit of Jesus into us, so that there is no need to watch points. But how on earth is that to be done? First, by humility, by recognising that unless Christ comes to our rescue, we can do nothing about our sick and sinful state. Second, by faith, by trusting that Christ died for us, even that he died for me. Third, by trusting Christ's promise that if only we will surrender to him, he will take us over. Fourth, by praying for that to happen. Fifth, by studying Christ's actions and words in the scriptures so that we follow his injunction to learn from me. Matthew chapter 11 verse 29. Finally, and most important of all, by communicating with Christ and the whole church at the liturgy, by taking into ourselves Christ's body and blood. Christ set up this way of transforming us into him of giving us the Holy Spirit. It has an effect on us beyond what we may think or feel it is doing. We have emphasised before in this course how essential communion is. Our engine is built to function on the Spirit of Christ. The Church, when it celebrates the liturgy, is the fuel depot designed to dispense that Spirit. And to refuse to go there regularly for supplies is self-destructive. No good complaining that the local filling station is a bit grotty or filling your car isn't clean enough to go there. Since that's the official source of supply, you have no alternative. What results can you expect from all this? You will find, bit by bit, that the promise of the prophet Ezekiel is fulfilled. Our stony heart will begin to turn into a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 11.19, chapter 36, verse 26. You will be Christ-tenderized, spirit-guided, sensitive to God and to other people. Recognising that God loves you as you are and will rescue you from anything, you start to respond with gratitude and love, and that love will spill over to loving other people. And so you discover the truth of Christ saying that all moral behaviour, all holiness and goodness, boil down to two requirements. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Matthew chapter 22 verses 37 to 40. We sometimes miss one part of what Christ is saying there. You are to love your neighbour as yourself. To be able to love other people, you have first to love yourself. There is no room in Christianity for devaluing or hating oneself. Sometimes you may even need to say to yourself, who are you anyway to rubbish someone that God created and Christ thought worth dying for? We are commanded to give to everyone else the same interest, attention, value and importance as we give to ourselves and our own concerns. And getting even near that balance of caring for God, self and other people equally will be a lifetime's work. Well, it's all very well, you might say, talking about love of God and love of one's neighbour, but what does it mean in real life? How do I decide the moral issues that confront me every hour of my day? I'm not going to make the mistake that many zealous Christians make. I'm not going to make you a new book of rules selected from bits of the Old Testament law that happened to suit me, together with some sayings of Jesus turned into hard and fast rules. The orthodox way to holiness is by acquiring the mind of Christ, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to take three areas of human concern, sexual relations, work and possessions, and ask in each case, 
what would the mind of Christ lead us to think and to do? But before we even touch on these questions of practical behaviour, let's get one thing straight. This is something for you. You may use it to guide others, as Christians use the wisdom and experience of the body of Christ, all those Christ-minded people over the centuries who together make up Christ's church to declare God's will for human society. But what you must never do is to use your understanding of what Christ is calling you to do as a stick with which to beat others. You are not to judge them in the sense of convicting or condemning them. Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 to 5. Christ tells some of his fiercest parables against those who set themselves up as better than their neighbours or who fully knowing that they have been forgiven by God still refuse to forgive other people. Look at Matthew chapter 18 verses 23 to 35. Christianity is what is known as a revealed religion. That is to say, we believe certain truths have been communicated to human beings by God, truths that we might well not have thought of for ourselves if we'd been left to our own devices. We believe that the Bible in its Old and New Testaments contains this revelation. In the matter of sexual relations, we believe that the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, indicates why God created sexuality and how it should be used. We also believe that Jesus Christ in the New Testament endorsed this understanding. The book of Genesis tells how God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1 verse 27. In other words, sexual difference, male and female, was there from the beginning, and man and woman are made to go together, and together equally they make up man, the human race. That unity is signified and created by them coming together in sexual intercourse. This Old Testament revelation is repeated by Jesus when he's asked about marriage and divorce. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And he's quoting Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. So he goes on, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined? Let not man put asunder. That's Mark chapter 10 verses 5 to 9 and it's repeated in Matthew 19 verses 4 to 5. Sex was there to make and maintain a permanent bond between a man and woman, a marriage. Note that marriage was in paradise, part of the ideal state before the fall. But it is now part of a corrupted world. And if marriage is to be returned to its original state, it needs the redeeming power of Christ. That is one of the many meanings of this wonderful fresco. This is an image of the crucified but victorious Christ, who after his death has descended to break down the gates of hell and release all those who died before his time and were held prisoner by the evil one. First to be released are the father and mother of the race, Adam and Eve. In some versions, Adam and Eve come from different sides of the picture, a division which signifies their disunity in their married state. But Christ is literally yanking them together as he draws them out from sin and death. Christ restores the threefold relationship of marriage, a triple bond between man and woman and God, who holds them all together in a trinity of love. The Western churches teach that marriage is a sacred contract, but made by the couple when they give their promises to one another. In a Western marriage service, these vows made by the couple to each other legally constitute their marriage. An orthodox marriage does not have vows, so in the law's eyes it is not a legal contract. 
That is why we have a civil ceremony also, so the state can recognize the union as binding. In the orthodox marriage, the sacrament is celebrated by the priest representing Christ, who marries the couple to one another. He performs the sacrament. In Christ's name, he restores a unity that has been lost, healing our sinfulness and our broken relationships, recreating through marriage. Because of the understanding that has been revealed to it, the Church has necessarily to declare that permissive sex, sleeping around, is contrary to God's intention. Because Christ's saying makes clear that the bond between man and woman one to one is exclusive and for life. Sex is a major means by which two individuals are bonded into one flesh. And I'd like to add as a matter of personal observation that the attempt to break off a sexual relationship and form another is tearing away part of oneself. It is like undergoing major surgery. Similarly, the Orthodox Church is bound to oppose homosexual relations, physical sexual relations between people of the same sex, because the scriptures make crystal clear that the marriage bond was designed to be between two different yet complementary partners, a man and a woman. Leviticus chapter 18 verse 22 rather savagely calls male homosexuality an abomination, detestable, a perversion of God-designed behaviour, grouped there with perversions such as a woman having sexual relationships with an animal, which is condemned in the next verse. The attempt to make one flesh physically of people of the same sex or between a human and an animal is therefore doomed to failure, to be a grotesque, unhealthy parody of sexual activity as God designed it. The orthodox view is that homosexual acts fall short of God's intention for us and are part of the general sinfulness of unredeemed human nature but they are not given the special attention accorded them by some Western moralists. Note that there is nothing in all this to forbid love, even intense love, between persons of the same sex. King David in the Old Testament praises his friend Jonathan, whose love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Second book of Samuel, chapter 1, verse 26. Married or unmarried, we are called to love other people, and we need for our health and for our sense of our own value to be loved by them. We can't have enough of love. What are we to say about premarital sex, sexual relations between a couple who are intending to marry? They are fulfilling God's intention that we be bonded together into one flesh. But because we are fallen human beings, we need the Christian sacrament of marriage to restore our sexual relationship to what it should be. To embark on being one flesh without first asking for Christ's action to put us to rights is unnecessary risk-taking. Putting it bluntly, it's rather foolish. As for trial marriages, so-called, trying it out to see if it works or suits, that involves both selfishness and a lack of faith. The lack of faith is in the power of Christ to form a marriage that will last, and it's also a lack of faith in the ability of yourself and your partner to make a lasting commitment. The selfishness comes in being prepared, if the relationship doesn't work out, to dump a partner who might be totally devoted to you. As with other ruptures in human relationships, there are almost always casualties and damage. In interpreting the great moral principles revealed by the Christian faith, a priest when he gives advice and a bishop when he exercises his authority will use a considerable measure of what is called economia, economy. This economy is from the Greek Oikonomia, what Dimitri Staniloa, the great Romanian theologian, describes as the energy of God, making us aware of him, 
making us more fully aware of ourselves and tenderizing us towards our fellow human beings. Metropolitan Callistos defines economy in operation as pastoral flexibility according to the particular situation of each person. Putting it more simply, it is love of God and love of people before rules. The principle of economy explains why the Orthodox Church's attitude to divorce and remarriage sometimes seems to other Christians a bit lax. It seems to directly contradict Christ's command that man should not put asunder what God has joined. The Orthodox Church does emphasise with Christ that marriage is for life, but it also acknowledges, as Christ does, that this world is fallen, corrupted by the powers of evil. Human beings suffer accidents, disasters, and the effects of wrongdoing, often not of their own making. Marriages break down, prove unworkable, or are contrary to the well-being of the partners. Married couples can reject the redemptive grace of Christ offered in the sacrament of marriage. For this reason, that the Church conveys Christ's understanding and forgiveness to a broken world, the Orthodox allow divorce and remarriage, though the right for a second or third marriage is more penitential than celebratory. But even then, Metropolitan Callistos tells me that in practice, the penitential right for remarriage is rarely used. A major principle witnessed by the Orthodox Church in common with other Christian churches is the sanctity of human life. Every human existence is created by God and belongs to him. To kill another human being is murder, and the Orthodox Church recognises that this is an evil whatever the circumstances. We do not condone suicide or euthanasia because our lives are not our own to terminate them when we see fit. Still less are we at liberty to kill children yet unborn or children shortly after birth. To do so is sacrilege, the violation of something holy, something that is a potential dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The early fathers and the whole church as a whole from its beginnings, in all places and at all times, held to the principle that abortion and infanticide are murder, the snuffing out of a sacred life that belongs to God. Because the practice of abortion has been widespread in ancient and modern societies, the Church's stand has been both courageous and unpopular. The Church's opposition to abortion is crystal clear, and Britain, in common with many Western societies, stands under the judgment of God for the wholesale slaughter of unborn babies. In 1999, for example, just short of 174,000 abortions were performed in England and Wales. In the matter of work, we are going to need a large measure of economia. Work now is often something we do just to survive, a drudgery that serves chiefly to feed ourselves and our loved ones. Yet work was in paradise, according to the book of Genesis, and it was pleasurable. It gave human beings the joy of appreciating, sharing in, and cooperating in God's creativity, as any good gardener knows. Work was once something you did as a love gesture for your fellow human beings, as when a mother bakes a cake for her family. But we are often in modern society at a great distance from those who are supposed to benefit from our work. Work no longer feels like something we do to help others and be appreciated by them. The story is told of how a strange little creature walked into the Ministry of Education in London and the bureaucrats gathered round trying to puzzle out what it was. Finally, someone greatly daring said, I think it's a child. Distance may also disguise from us the evil our work causes. Only now are people becoming aware that low prices in the coffee and chocolate trades 
are built on poor conditions and even slave labour in the third world. Some of these things we can influence. We can buy our coffee or our chocolate from fair trade organisations who keep an eye on the work conditions of their suppliers. But because the Western churches have largely failed to bring Christ to bear on ruthless commercial competition and the harshness of the market economy, the bulk of workers are required at times to do things that they feel or know to be wrong. Not everyone can move into professions or jobs that seem to make it less difficult to be a Christian. You are fortunate if you can be a doctor or nurse, a professor or a teacher, though I'd say from hard experience that even there temptations assail you. If you can make a job shift, you probably should. If your muscles brought you to be a bouncer at a gambling saloon or a strip club or a bailiff or a debt collector, Maybe you would be better off digging the roads, as the saying is. If enough people made that choice, it would become impossibly expensive to engage bouncers to deal with rowdies, bailiffs to seize people's possessions, so that casinos and strip clubs would have to close and debt collection agencies find more humane ways of getting back what is owed. But the fact remains that the corrupt nature of the world means that most, if not all of us who work in it, have at times to get our hands dirty. We need, therefore, the liturgy's constantly repeated prayer, Lord, have mercy. And in dealing with ourselves and accepting guidance from other Christians, we will need a degree of economia of tempering the absolute principles of Christian behaviour, which are love of God and love of others, to the realities of our actual situation. We will need the mind of Christ to tell us, in the terms of the popular prayer, those things we can change and those things we cannot. Above all, we will need to remember that we are, as Christians, servants of a king whose rule is not acknowledged by the corrupt powers that govern this world. The revolution has begun, but is not yet finished, that will transform the kingdoms of this world into the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. So you are like partisans in occupied territory. You don't sacrifice your life or your livelihood at every opportunity, but you wait till you are called to make a stand to strike for truth where it will really make an impact. An accountant who queries every little personal expense the boss tries to swing onto the company will never rise to a position where he can expose the company itself for its fraudulent accounts. But to know when and when not to make a stand, you have to keep tuned to high command. Prayer is the radio through which your instructions will come. Last of all, and briefly, I want to talk about the product of our work, money and possessions and the power they give. If you are a Christian, you are called, as at baptism, to turn to Christ and to keep turning to Christ. Don't let me disguise from you the reality of what that means. Conversion to Christ means also conversion of the wallet. The Christ we have talked about so much will not allow you to call anything your own. Sooner or later he will make it clear that you have given him a right to all that you are and all that you possess. Anything you have is what Christ has given you back, permitted you to use, and for all that he has given or returned, he will expect an account. Did you use it for his purposes? That is a crunch point for many people. The Jews established a principle of tithing. One-tenth of what you have is for God, the rest is your own. Many of the Protestant churches follow this rule of a tenth for the church. And that is why their churches have funds for so many good works in education, health care, social service and the like. If we Orthodox began to imitate them, there is so much that we could do. I say it's a crunch point, because the thought of turning everything over to Christ terrifies us. 
We want security. I will only feel secure when the mortgage is paid off, when the house is mine, and then there's also a little bit in the bank that no one can touch but me, just for any emergency. But, as I once heard the former Anglican Bishop of Salisbury, Joe Fison, say, keeping a little hidden away in reserve is a major cause of faith going dead. He said that when people came to him complaining that Christ, God, religion was starting to mean less and less to them, he almost always found it was a case of what he called lumber in the attic. Areas of one's life, of one's concerns or activities or possessions that you weren't prepared to let Jesus Christ get his hands on. Keep off Jesus, that bit's for me. Christ demands your all. And giving your all to Christ is the essence of Christian behaviour. The rewards are far more than we can imagine. A life cleansed and fulfilled because we are being turned into the likeness of God in Christ. Oh.